and again, we're back on our YouTube channel here, and I have a very special guest again, Mr. Michael Coswin of Sprott. We're here at the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium. It's the last day. It's been a very, very busy four days. A lot of people, a lot of excellent ideas in terms of how to invest in the sector. Uh, Michael, thanks a lot for being on the on the segment. My pleasure. Thanks, uh, Sonny, for having me. Excellent. So let's just talk about the, the Resource Symposium, first of all. So, sure. Four days. I mean, what was some things, I guess, that came across your mind from last year to this year? And um, what are some lessons that I think some investors can take? Yeah, with them? I think it's been a fantastic conference. We've had over 700 attendees. It's gone very, very well. Contrasted mm -hmm. to last year, it's, I, I won't say night and day, but it's certainly twice the number of people uh, from, from last year, which I also mm -hmm. attended here. Um, so I think that you've had a lot more focus on the precious metals space and that's sort of done well for this uh, this symposium which is mm -hmm. becoming the vanguard uh, conference i believe mm -hmm. uh in the in vancouver especially this time of year uh for junior resource companies and junior junior equities right so, so uh, and then how what do you think in terms of what investors can learn going forward from this year. I mean, we've seen an uptick in their, in their attendees, of course, a lot of great speakers. Um, you know, gold, obviously, the way it's trading and silver, precious metals, a complete night and day, just like you said. Well, what lessons do you think? We, we, general pride, lessons? we pride ourselves on handpicking the exhibitors that are here. Okay. Um, it's not just somebody who can uh, cash, you know, write a check and fog a mirror, for mm -hmm. instance. We, we're looking at a higher quality companies that we've invested in meaningfully uh, at Sprott or are involved in in some way. So, of course, we have a high opinion of a lot of the uh, exhibitors, and we think that they represent a lot of good choices for attendees and our, our clients alike. It's really a matter of them getting to know each other and becoming comfortable with their investment mm -hmm. ideas. So I think what attendees are looking for is is affirmation of the macro, what's happening to gold, why is it happening, getting really good insights from speakers um, such as uh, Jim Rickards I know spoke today, right. yeah. and, and some other, let's say, heavyweights from the economic side of the sphere, and then blending that down to the intermediate to smaller cap companies where you're looking at a specific investment in a specific company and what kind of resources that they have. What have they been doing during the downturn? Mm -hmm. What have they, often what sets the stage for a very successful junior company is what and how do they manage bad news or misery? Mm -hmm. And if they've been able to capitalize on it, use their capital effectively, keep their share structures intact, they often represent these very strong uh, investment thesis going mm -hmm. forward. And that's what we're seeing here at this conference as well, Interesting. is the companies are now bold enough mm -hmm. to get from out of lying in a semi-prone position underneath their desk as they may have been over the last three years and right. now coming forward and saying, look what we've been after, look what we've done. We've been able to make these acquisitions in a down market and now we're looking to advance them and possibly uh, look at some equity as well. Interesting. So then let's let's go on this on when we talked about it back at PDAC. It's been several months since then. We talked about capitulation. I guess his capitulation gone. Uh, you know, we're we're past that point. I think there's a real. There's been a strong move up. We've had the best quarter in the precious metal space in 30 years. Yeah. So I think the capitulation process is done. It hit some kind of hard bottom, and it's ramped up very quickly to levels that people are now, quite frankly, somewhat suspect of. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the, a 10 cent stock, uh, let's say January 1st of this year, is now trading at 55 or 60 cents, therefore it's become overvalued. Right. But I think that misses the big point. In a relative sense, yes, it's moved up and it's, uh, I wouldn't say overvalued, but it certainly had a strong share price uh, appreciation. Mm -hmm. But still in the context of valuations, it's still possibly very cheap. Still need to pick and choose because I don't. I think while the turn has been um, with us, you still need to be very thoughtful as far as what kind of stocks that you're going mm -hmm. to look to own. So you right. still want quality type ventures mm -hmm. um, that are out there, and you you've got the capability of buying them at very low uh, prices at this point in time. You define cheap, uh, you know, uh, in terms of valuation, because you know these stocks have had a really strong run up. 
And are you comparing that to historical reference, or how well, are you kind of? I think valid? that's a good point, Sonia. Okay. I think you know, relatively speaking, if you're taking the myopic view of a chart that looks um, six months old, right. for instance, then you may come to that conclusion. And I know we've got yeah. you know, in the world of high frequency traders and people wanting to <laughs> you know be on the on the right side of the trade, that may impress them. Uh, but if you look, if you take a step back and mm -hmm. you look at the values and you look at let's say a 10-year chart and you look at where we stand in that context, mm -hmm. we're still at extremely low levels. Let me, let me give you a specific example here, not, not to beat you with, uh, with statistics too much, but mm -hmm. let's say the HUI to gold ratio, which is one of my favorite ah, kind right. of measurements. So you're yeah. looking at an index of gold-related stocks. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis or with a ratio to the gold price. In the higher markets of 2006 and 2007, that ratio was in and around, let's say, 0.55 to 0.6. Okay. And I call that a more normalized market. Right. In January, it was at 0.1. Now it's at 0.2. Interesting. So it's still a very, very low level that we're working from, mm -hmm. uh, and there still speaks to the upsides. And, and a couple of things can happen in that context, including an improving um, gold price. You know, a lot of these um, companies have just uh, reported earnings as of yesterday, right. in fact. Yeah. And yeah. the senior gold companies are really showing decent cash flow numbers. Right. One, they're certainly helped out by the hi higher cash, or sorry, higher gold price, which mm -hmm. is helping you know, the obvious uh, returns that they're getting, but also the deflation that we've seen in this market, certainly in the context of the other commodities, oil, steel, copper, all those other things are so subdued that their cash flow numbers are looking fantastic because right. they've been able to really hem in and lower um, their costs and expenses. Interesting. So then, you know, we also talked about the three themes uh, or three types of investors back at PDEC as well. You had thematic, pragmatic, and explorationist, and very easy to understand. And just want to go over, you know, I get, uh, as, as if you were to pick one of those investors at that point in time when we spoke, what would have worked well for them at that point until now, and where do you go going forward? I mean, I know every individual investor is different, but I guess... Sure. I don't think there's a best. I mean, uh, yeah. to use an analogy, it's kind of like, well, what's your favorite car? Well, it kind of depends what yeah. you're going to do. If you right. want to you know, ride fast on the weekend and have the top down, you need a Ferrari or a sports car or right. something of that nature. Yeah. So that's a different... Plenty of those in Vancouver, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen a few here, for sure. <laughs> now, that's a lot of fun, and that's, that's a great thing to be doing on a nice Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, but it may not be very practical if you want to head up to Whistler and go camping for the next three right. days. So, right. you know, there you need, uh, you know, the equipment and whatnot. So they're, they're different in that sense. What, what I will speak to is the exploration stocks, which are always near and dear to my heart, because I think you're looking at something that can dri drive true alpha. And the idea of these five and ten baggers of which dreams are made of right. are really the kind of stocks that most speculators uh, are typically looking for. And by and large, they've lagged right. realistically. Yeah. And the reason, I think of them more like a slingshot. And what's been happening here is the band has been pulled back more and more. So the mm -hmm. capability for them to fire forward hard and fast is getting better and better mm -hmm. as this bullish trend goes along. But they haven't necessarily been identified because we've come from such a, an ugly place and such yeah. a dark, deep hole that it's only now that they're able to get their heads above ground, get their projects in order, maintain the properties they want, and start to go about intelligent um, capital expenditures mm -hmm. on their different projects in order to um, highlight again, the mineral resource that they've mm -hmm. got. So that's why there tends to be a lag here. Um, the bear market has been very deep and, and nasty, so yeah. it takes a while for these junior companies to get a little a uh, little bit more on side. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, going back to our, our larger cap companies, as we mentioned, just reported right. earnings, Absolutely, yeah. things are looking better. Yeah. So they're starting to breathe a little bit easier and saying internal cash flow is starting to come around. Now we can start talking about expenditures in another way in a department or a field we've been neglecting for the last years called exploration. Yes. Yeah. So now it's going to, that ray of light that's come through the senior end is going to start to show itself on mm -hmm. the junior picture. And do you think that we're still going to be seeing a lot of M&A activity amongst the mid-tiers still? Can you? 
I do. I think okay. that the the intermediate to mid sized players they they want to be big boys. Mm. They that's everybody's aspiration is to be bigger than you are and to have a, a much uh, more successful and, and bigger company. They've been able to jump out of the starting blocks faster than the big guys because right. the big guys have been punished by debt. Right. Really punished by debt. Love. Deflationary environment as we've been in. Debt is a killer, and yeah. that's why you're seeing them so uh, tarnished and bruised. Meanwhile, the mid-sized player, because they could never take on as much debt mm -hmm. in the first place, right. they didn't have it. Right. So that's, in a sense, been their saving grace, has allowed them to get out of the starting blocks sooner than most, certainly sooner than the big guys, right. make the acquisitions that were strategic and worthwhile for them to make, right. and then start to consolidate uh, land uh, positions and really show big production growth mm -hmm. because again they were already small enough. Right. enough. Yeah. The bigger problem for the seniors is coming. Right. Their day of reckoning is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to talk in terms of being on a production cliff, right. not having adequate reserves or a combination of those problems, the senior companies will have to come out and really look at the problems that they have. Yeah. You know, when you produce six or seven million ounces per annum, you've got a real liability now. If you yeah. think about it, the average head grade for a lot of these, uh, let's say for gold production worldwide, is to the order of one gram per ton. So you've got a huge problem with the uh, the grades falling off a cliff. So where, how are they going to produce it, I guess, is the first question. Mm -hmm. And then if they do find a deposit, you're looking at things that are quite capital intensive, right. which yeah. the senior companies and every company is still sensitive on. Yeah. Because what does a higher CapEx bill require? Well, it requires debt. Yeah. And debt was the thing. It's sort of like just recovering from a hangover and then grabbing the whiskey bottle again right. the very next day and saying, this right. is going to, you know, I've <laughs> got to take this medicine yeah. uh, in order to keep going. It, they're going to be hesitant to do it. And I think that that's, um, that's going to represent challenges, which is why going full circle back to exploration, <laughs> exploration is going to be in the limelight, not right. just the little shards of sunlight that you're seeing now, it's going to be hyper-focused mm -hmm. on and in center stage. If you are able to find, a, as a junior company, a high-grade resource, that will get the attraction of everybody, from right. intermediate to senior in particular. Right. And the seniors can certainly uh, you know, put the cudgel down or slam the hammer down and make that acquisition um, in order to survive. It's an industry-wide problem as opposed to company-specific. Mm -hmm. The juniors are, are you know, at a point where they also have to get financing for that, right? I mean, before, several years ago, it was the majors and the mid-tiers putting their faith and their money into these juniors, find us some discoveries, and, you know, expand the ounces. We haven't really seen that, really, with, with, the, uh, you know, with the exception of a select few. So, that's a, is that a junior problem still to get access to financing? It's Has a, that changed it's, a bit? It's a problem, yeah. um, but going back to the seniors once again, a lot yeah. of them are taking a bit of a different tact. They, okay. they have decimated their exploration groups. It's right. hard to find exploration geologists at the senior mining companies right. these days. Mm -hmm. um, what the tact they're taking on is really making these smaller scale investments, so toehold investments, into junior resource companies or junior projects that they like. Mm -hmm. And in effect, subcontracting the exploration detail to that company. Uh, there's some companies in particular that have been very famous in doing it. They'll right. buy 10 to 20 percent, right. sit there, watch the developments, and as things go the right way, then they'll decide whether or not they want to make the acquisition. Right. It's obviously, you know, I think of it as a 100-meter dash. It's easier mm -hmm. to win the 100-meter dash if, if I'm the guy who starts, if I'm racing against you and I start on the 20-meter right. line and you're still at the, the starting point, yeah. so to yeah. speak. Yeah. So I think that's the way they're looking and positioning themselves for that. The equity capital, as far as the uh, junior companies are concerned, it's still fairly timid mm -hmm. and it's still fairly reserved. And we talked about the juniors and lack of access to funding is quite timid. Okay, so the industry itself has, in terms of the financing side of things, that's been, uh, that's changed significantly over the last few years as well because you've seen brokerages um, who are very mining finance focused. You've seen some mergers of, you know, so to speak, uh, and some brokerages have just been out of that space. So how does that 
change the industry now because um, what I've been hearing is that you're seeing some private equity come in that usually are not necessarily. So you might know a little bit more about that as well. Oh, absolutely. That That is what's happening. You know, I, I'm in Toronto these days, which which historically has always been the place to go for mining finance in Canada. And um, certainly amongst the intermediate and larger type deals that are out there, um, the financial firms have been seriously reduced in number that used to use that as their calling card. So the traditional, meanwhile, you've got within the brokerage industry a lot of regulations that make it difficult for access to smaller cap companies mm -hmm. to begin with. And I think that there's a space there that has been open for groups like private equity, as you're, you're mentioning. So private equity and the industry players themselves are looking to fund these kinds of projects and these this kind of capital. And that's sort of the route that I see uh, having developed that was traditionally in the hands of just the purest speculators. And that's been, that's a new element that's been involved. The challenge for private equity, however, has been the fact that they're managing a lot of money. And when you try right. to manage it in a relatively small space, you end up being the, you know, the, the, the bull elephant right. in the china shop. Yeah, and absolutely. It, you know, breathing is going to become a problem. As right. You're going to knock over some high-grade right. china. Right. So I think the private equity firms are looking not only at the equity level, but they're looking at transitioning that all the way along in mm -hmm. structuring mezzanine debt, debt facilities, and even senior debt uh, mm -hmm. where, where it is likely all the way up to royalties, in yeah. fact. So mm -hmm. there's a, a whole bunch of other elements as far as what was historically traditional equity that was raised for these junior yeah. companies. We're back in the last really strong bull market, but I remember uh, visiting with the firms in, on, in New York and Wall Street, and really what they were looking for was leverage to gold. All they really wanted oh, to know is how many ounces of gold did you have backing each share. Yeah. And they weren't really qualitative. They weren't lo really looking at, well, does it become a mine? Yeah. I'm not saying that didn't matter, but let's say it wasn't as important as probably should be from a mining engineer's right. perspective yeah. to build yeah. it. Yeah. So I think that those types of plays got really uh, bought because they satisfied that that component for, let's say, a larger fund that was trying to get this leverage or relativity to the gold price. Mm -hmm. And they do get it in spades, um, whether or not that's... Uh, the most viable option you can make is is an entirely different discussion. Yeah. Interesting, very interesting. Well, let's just finish off with a question I've asked a couple of uh, guests that are on the segment, and that's talking about the U.S. dollar, because you know, with the way the world is, you know, sure. the usual safe haven is gold sure. or silver, and you know, but at the same time, a unique phenomenon is kind of occurring at this time where the U.S. dollar has been rally rallying as well, and you know, the argument is okay, well. I want to put my money in U.S. dollars as well, but sure. and gold and silver. So, but they're both trending positively in correlation. So, recently, very true. In fact, the correlation between gold and the U.S. dollar has never been higher in 15 years. So, you're right. absolutely right, Sonny. Um, you know, I have a lot of clients and friends who are in the United States, and uh, to a degree, I, you know the. The saying familiarity breeds contempt comes to mind when I hear them talk about wanting to have an aversion towards the dollar and the dollar right. is going to go lower. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, that's true, but what the bigger picture that you have to consider is not just the fact of your dollar. You have to contrast it to everybody else's fiat currencies. And you're looking yeah. at how badly they're treating their currency like a, a dirty diaper. Yeah. And you look at how badly it's treated in the United States. And it's not that it's a absolute measure because they're all trending down. Right. But it's a relative measure as far as who's falling harder and faster at yeah. any given time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think also the it's always important to note that regardless of how hated someone may think of the U.S. dollar, is still a very deep and transparent pool of capital. It is the world reserve currency yeah. that's out there. So there are certain elements to it that are very important. And in the very short term, I think that the the fiascos that's going on between the central bankers and, and the concerns with respect to the fiat currency systems are creating two, sign, two mindsets in effect. Right. You've got one mindset that's thinking of value and you've got one mindset that's thinking of liquidity. Right. And so on the value side, I think they're comfortable looking at gold now right. as 
the, the 6,000 year old store of value. Mm -hmm. And on the liquidity side, it's still about the US dollar. And that's giving them the flexibility to look at other investments and other types of investment themes that they can move to quickly. And then on the gold side, you're seeing inflows there as well. But you know, you have to remember this gold store of value market yeah. is really small. Right. Uh, and when yeah. you've got money coming out of the bonds, yes, it is affecting the S&P 500, which is responsible for its current uptrend. Right. Uh, right. But it, and a trickle of it is going into gold, which is causing, relatively speaking, quite decent moves. Mm -hmm. And that's, I believe, what we're going to continue to see, especially as we see this financial, political uncertainty in yeah. front of us. Yeah. Well, the election's coming up and more QE supposedly coming up. Japan's already done it. Um, I guess we'll see. I guess, I guess that's another discussion we'll have on the bonds. That's a, that's I think that's the next right. one we'll have. <laughs> exactly. We're having these economic discussions without a, without a, a jar of whiskey. In yeah, front exactly. It's yeah. dangerous, for sure. <laughs> well, thanks, Michael. Thanks a lot for being on the segment. And if you want to find out more information, you can contact Michael Carlson. We'll have the information for you on our on our video here. And you can ask him any questions directly on the, on the metal sector or anything else in terms of investing. And... Uh, and if you have more, find more information about the Sprout Natural Resource Symposium, we'll put information on that as well. So thanks, Michael. Fantastic. Excellent. Thanks, Sonny. Yeah, no problem. Cheers.